uh, PowerPoint. Ah, uh, so can you all see the uh, the it, uh, it, PowerPoint? It slide? Okay. Fantastic. So anyway, it is a enormous honor and pleasure to have the opportunity to talk with you uh, today. For me, this morning. For you, this evening. And uh, that is really an especial honor uh, that you all would uh, give up your Friday evening, part of your weekend, uh, to hear me talk uh, about some of uh, the research that we have done. So I really thank you so, so much uh, for uh, this honor uh, that you have uh, offered me. So anyway, uh, as you heard, the title of my talk is Rheumatic Disease and the Human Condition. And uh, I guess the first thing that I need to do here uh, is to indicate that I have no disclosures uh, to make, no uh, conflicts of interest, no financial conflicts of interest. And let us move on uh, to the talk itself. So rheumatic disease and the human condition. Uh, the, this is an idea that I thought would be fun to consider, uh, especially uh, when this is a weekend talk. And the question that I'm going to pose to you is, is rheumatic disease inevitable? Is it inevitable as a defense against microbial pathogens? Is it inevitable as the exaggeration of the range of normal? Is it inevitable as a part of the process of aging? And so to consider these three possibilities, I'm going to talk to you about uh, the recent work of three of the fellows uh, in my lab or who have recently uh, uh, finished uh, working in my lab. Uh, and their work has been published uh, over the last six months. Actually, uh, one of the uh, pieces of work was published in August uh, in uh, Nature Immunology. Another was published in the PNAS in June. And the third uh, that you're going to hear about is uh, actually available online uh, from the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, but has not yet been published in print. So hopefully these are things that are uh, interesting because they're relatively current uh, and will allow us to think about uh, this question of the possible inevitability of rheumatic disease. So the first question that uh, we wanted to pose is the question of the role of natural selection in autoinflammatory disease. Now, just for those of you who may not be familiar with autoinflammatory diseases, uh, this is a group of uh, disorders, the autoinflammatory diseases are a group of disorders that we first recognized uh, back in 1999 when we described uh, the disease called TRAPS, TNF receptor associated periodic syndrome. And these are disorders in which patients have seemingly unprovoked episodes of inflammation without the high titer autoantibodies or antigen specific T cells that one would ordinarily see in autoimmune diseases, and of course, without any uh, uh, evidence of ongoing infection. So the autoinflammatory diseases are a group of diseases that uh, are primarily caused by uh, disorders of the innate branch of the immune system. That is to say, the part of the immune system that's mediated by myeloid cells in which the receptors uh, are um, germline receptors. They're, they're hardwired uh, into the genome. Whereas the autoimmune diseases, as I think many of you know, uh, the key players in the auto autoimmune diseases are lymphocytes and their receptors, of course, somatically mutate and rearrange. So anyway, uh, we were posing this question of the uh, role of natural selection in autoinflammatory disease. And we were focusing on one particular autoinflammatory disease that my research lab has been interested in for many years. And that is the disease familial Mediterranean fever. Um, and the person who was doing this work uh, remember, I mentioned that this is the recent work of, of fellows from my lab is Yoan Park, uh, who has now gone back to Korea. He was a fellow uh, working with us uh, from Korea, and he was uh, aided and abetted, so to speak, by Jay Che and Elaine Remmers, staff scientists in my lab, uh, and Daniel Schreiner, who's a staff scientist in Charles Rotimi's lab. And um, 
they were interested in this question of why are the carrier frequencies for familial Mediterranean fever so high in multiple Middle Eastern populations? Now, again, just some uh, background information for those of you who don't know about familial Mediterranean fever. FMF is a disease in which patients get relatively short, one to three day episodes of fever associated with either severe abdominal pain or severe chest pain or arthritis. It's caused by uh, inflammation of the uh, sterile inflammation of the peritoneal cavity or the pleural space or the synovial membranes. And at least some patients will go on actually to develop systemic AA amyloidosis and can die of kidney failure or did die of kidney failure before the advent of, of appropriate treatment for FMF. And we discovered the gene for FMF back in 1997. FMF is recessively inherited and it's caused by mutations in a gene called MEFV, which encodes a protein called pyrin. Uh, which is involved in the regulation of IL-1 production. The uh, pyrin nucleates an inflammasome that is important in the uh, activation of interleukin-1 in response to various bacteria. So the question was, why are there such high carrier frequencies for FMF in multiple Middle Eastern populations? And this table shows you uh, for four different uh, populations, uh, the frequencies of three different mutations in the FMF gene, and then the total uh, carrier frequency uh, in, uh, in these populations. And so you can see that in the Turkish population, the carrier frequency is, whoops, uh, let me go forward again. The carrier frequency is 0.127, uh, which means that uh, roughly 12.7% of the Turkish population are carriers for some mutation, at least of these three, uh, some mutation in the FMF gene. And you can see that amongst Armenians, the figure is 11.1%. Arabs, 10.7%. Non-Ashkenazi Jewish people, also 10.7%. Those are extraordinarily high carrier frequencies. Just to put that in some perspective, the carrier frequency for cystic fibrosis, which is the most common lethal recessive disorder in North America, is about 4%. And here we're talking about 10 to 12% or so uh, carrier frequencies in total uh, for familial Mediterranean fever. And what's more, you can see that it's multiple different mutations that are involved in it and different mutations in different populations so that it really would seem like maybe this is something that has been selected for in history rather than that it's just some sort of a coincidence, a founder effect, as one might say, uh, due to some sort of a population bottleneck uh, somewhere in the history of these, these populations. So that's what we thought was that it was probably uh, uh, some sort of a uh, selective advantage. Uh, but in order to really demonstrate that, you have to do a little bit more than that. And so uh, what one has to do in order to really prove that there would have been some sort of selective advantage for mutations in the FMF gene is that you have to look at the chunk of DNA surrounding the FMF gene either in people who are carriers for FMF mutations or in people who don't have FMF. And we happen to have genomic data for um, actually uh, about 2,500 uh, individuals from Turkey that we had been studying to study the genetics of a different disorder, Bechet's disease. But it allowed us uh, to do this kind of analysis where we had uh, a fairly dense map of uh, genetic markers throughout the genome for this 2,500 or so Turkish individuals. Um, and then we could look to see what is the chunk of DNA that's conserved amongst people who have a particular FMF mutation uh, versus uh, those uh, who do not. And so here you can see uh, for the M694V mutation, which is a very uh, important and severe mutation in the FMF uh, gene, uh, you can see that, that the chunk of DNA that's associated with the wild type allele 
is very small. It's just like this spike that you can see here. Whereas the chunk of DNA that's associated with the uh, M694V mutation is very big. It's a very broad chunk of DNA. That means that the DNA fingerprint that's associated with this mutation is, is uh, a fairly large one, extending a million base pairs out on either side, at least in some individuals. So that's the kind of thing that you would expect to see if there was some sort of a selective advantage, uh, because basically uh, that's telling us then that um, uh, essentially recombination uh, has, has not happened uh, as rapidly around the mutation as, as it has around uh, the wild type allele because of the fact that there has been possibly some selection. But you need to have even more information than that. And that is that you have to compare uh, these haplotypes that are associated with uh, the uh, mutant allele uh, with other haplotypes throughout the genome of Turkish people uh, that would be at the same frequency. And so if you do that, then what you're looking to see is whether the haplotype uh, that is associated with the FMF mutation is when it's compared with haplotypes of the same frequency, is it at the, uh, the edge of the curve? Is it at the tail of the bell-shaped curve? And you can see that, in fact, it is at the tail of the bell-shaped curve. So this is definitely telling us that there was selection of that particular allele. And we can do the same thing, and I won't show it to you here in these slides, but uh, in the paper that I will tell you about uh, in a little bit, uh, we have data with regard to the B726A mutation, which is another important FMF-associated mutation. What's more, one can analyze these kinds of genomic data to get some sort of an idea of what kind of selection, what uh, is the magnitude of selection that uh, this M694V mutation might have uh, been uh, undergoing. And uh, there's a way of, of calculating that, and that is shown basically in the lower left-hand uh, part of this slide. And you can see that the selection intensity is indicated as, as 0.077. So how does that compare with anything? Is, is that a high selection coefficient or not a very high selection coefficient? Well, so the selection coefficient coefficient for lactase persistence, which, you know, is, is the ability to digest cow's milk. And that's something that's been under selection in the Northern European population uh, and is a sort of a, a classic example of, of uh, a trait that has been under selection, um, is shown here at the bottom here as 0.056. So a selection coefficient of 0.077, that's high. Uh, that, again, is really telling us that these mutations, or this particular mutation anyway, in the FMF gene uh, has been under selection, uh, strong selection. Um, and then finally, uh, one can estimate when uh, that mutation would have first arisen and then been propagated into, uh, uh, into the Turkish population anyway. That's what we're looking at here is specifically relevant to the Turkish population. So there are three different methods one can use to estimate the age of the mutation. And you can see that the age of the mutation ranges from uh, 88 uh, before the common era, before Christ, uh, to uh, 3,500 years before the common era. In other words, the mutation is somewhere between two and, say, 5,000 years old. So that's, that's about the kind of range that you get when you do these kinds of calculations. It's not like it will tell you the exact year that the mutation arose, but it is telling us that the mutation would have arisen after the... Um, the onset of, of uh, civilization uh, and agriculture in the human population. Uh, so uh, at least uh, relatively recently, although not real recently in, in human history. So it gives us an idea uh, that the mutation is somewhere around two to 5,000 years old. So uh, we then have evidence that FMF mutations have in fact been under strong selection in the Turkish population. 
uh, and uh, that uh, these mutations probably arose uh, between two and 5,000 years ago. And we have similar data uh, for the V726A mutation again. So then you would then ask the question, well, so what could it have been that was selecting for the high carrier frequency of, of FMF? And in order to consider that question, you have to think about, well, what actually does pyrin do uh, in normal physiology? And so here, uh, I'm going to show you on this slide just the, a, a schematic diagram of of where does pyrin fit into uh, normal biology. So here, this at the bottom uh, is a depiction, a schematic of uh, the pyrin inflammasome, which uh, as uh, some of you probably know, the pyrin inflammasome whoops, uh, involves uh, the interaction of pyrin itself with a, a adapter protein called ASC and the uh, protein uh, caspase one. And when they assemble into a complex, then one can uh, get basically the cleavage of interleukin-1, pro-interleukin-1 beta to the activation of IL-1. So, so this pyrin inflammasome can form under some circumstances. Now, ordinarily, the pyrin inflammasome is highly regulated and is inhibited by the binding of uh, a protein called 1433 uh, to pyrin because pyrin ordinarily is phosphorylated at a couple of sites, 208 and 242. Uh, but um, that phosphorylation is mediated by a protein called PKN, which is actually activated um, uh, by uh, uh, Rho A, which is a GTPase that lives inside the cell membrane. So, so what ordinarily is happening is that Rho A activates PKN, which causes phosphorylation of pyrin, which then leads to 1433 binding of pyrin, which blocks the pyrin inflammasome. So that ordinarily, we're not walking around with our pyrin inflammasomes activated, making a lot of IL-1, because if so, then we would be walking around with fevers all the time and, and a lot of inflammation. So it's a tightly regulated process. But what triggers actually the activation of the pyrin inflammasome are bacterial toxins that inhibit Rho A. And when Rho A is inhibited, then PKN is inhibited, and the phosphorylation of pyrin is inhibited, and 1433 doesn't bind to pyrin, and so the pyrin inflammasome can form. Now, bacteria have, over the ages, developed toxins that actually inactivate Rho A. Now, the reason that bacteria have evolved toxins that inactivate Rho A is that Rho A is actually a very important molecule for white blood cells, to, for white blood cells to do the things that they need to do. Uh, white blood cells need Rho A to be active in order for them to migrate, in order for them to phagocytose, for them to degranulate. And so bacteria have evolved a bunch of different toxins over the ages to inactivate Rho A. And we think that the pyrin inflammasome is in fact sort of a, a host response, if you will, to these bacterial toxins uh, so that we have a way of countering bacteria that can inactivate Rho A. And so that's the basic story in terms of the pyrin inflammasome. And so then you can think about, well, what bacteria make toxins that inactivate Rho A? And what bacteria are so lethal that and were, you know, epidemic or pandemic in their magnitude that, uh, you know, it could make some sense that they might have selected for the high carrier frequencies of pyrin. And so, uh, and, and FMF mutations. And so one of the uh, bacteria that can activate the pyrin inflammasome is Yersinia pestis, which is the organism that is responsible for that causes the bubonic plague. And Yersinia pestis makes two toxins, YAP-E and YAP-T, which inactivate Rho A, and so therefore activate the pyrin inflammasome. So, you know, in the interaction between man and bubonic plague, uh, bubonic plague makes a toxin that activates the pyrin inflammasome, so we have a defense against the uh, bubonic plague. But 
uh, more recent versions of, of uh, Yersinia pestis, uh, versions of it that, that uh, have been involved in the epidemics that we know have occurred over history, have another toxin called YAP-M. And YAP-M is a diabolical toxin, uh, which actually can cause a protein called RSK2 inside the cell actually to phosphorylate pyrin. And when that happens, of course, when pyrin gets phosphorylated, then 1433 binds to, um, to pyrin and it blocks the pyrin inflammasome. And so, uh, you know, we have uh, bubonic plague making these toxins that inactivate Rho A. The pyrin inflammasome is, is our response to that, but then bubonic plague has made another toxin that inactivates the pyrin inflammasome. So that's, that's uh, an interesting thing. And what we're going to show in the next couple of slides is that, that actually mutant pyrin, the pyrin mutants that are associated with FMF are uh, uh, immune to, if you will, are unresponsive to uh, this YAPM induced phosphorylation. And so it's actually a protective uh, thing which has been selected for. Um, and so here, this slide just shows that um, this is the phosphorylation of pyrin, either uh, without YAPM or with YAPM, induced by PKN. And you can see that it's a, not a whole lot of phosphorylation. But on the other hand, RSK, this other protein that I told you, it really uh, dramatically uh, phosphorylates pyrin. So it, it is a strong uh, inhibitor of uh, the pyrin inflammasome. Now, the, the interesting thing, as I mentioned, is that, that if you actually look then at... Uh, I'm sorry, I think uh, that maybe someone is also talking. But anyway, uh, you can see on the left-hand side, these are um, basically uh, lysates uh, from healthy control individuals uh, that have been exposed uh, either not or to Yersinia pestis, and then looking for phosphorylated pyrin. And you can see, again, that the, in the healthy controls that Yersinia pestis induces a lot of phosphorylation of pyrin. And you can see that in all of these circled things. But if you take the lysates from uh, patients who have FMF, and the mutations of these people are shown across here, for those five individuals, if you look at the phosphorylation of pyrin that's induced uh, by Yersinia pestis, it's not so much at all. In fact, in some cases, it's, there's hardly any phosphorylation of pyrin. Uh, so that's what I'm saying, is that uh, the mutant form of pyrin, the FMF-associated mutations, are resistant to uh, YAPM-induced phosphorylation. And that then translates into increased IL-1 production in vitro. Uh, you can see here uh, when we uh, expose either control cells, whoops, uh, when we expose either con control cells or cells from FMF patients to Yersinia pestis, we get a lot more IL-1 being produced uh, uh, by those uh, FMF cells. What's more, if one looks at just heterozygotes, in other words, carriers for FMF, people that may not have FMF itself, but uh, they're carriers for it. They just have a single mutant allele. And you can see that, again, they produce uh, increased amounts of IL-1 beta uh, in response to Yersinia pestis. However, if you look at a Yersinia pestis that does not have YAPM, and remember I said that YAPM was the, the, the thing that makes all the difference here, then there is no difference between the control and the FMF cells in terms of the amount of IL-1 being produced. Or if you expose them to Burkholderia, Burkholderia senecopacea, which is a bacterium that doesn't have YAPM, but is similar in some ways to Yersinia pestis, again, you don't see that difference. What's more, if we uh, uh, breed mice uh, that uh, have the FMF mutation knocked into them, we see an interesting phenomenon as well. Now, of course, we wouldn't want to expose humans uh, to Yersinia pestis and see whether or not FMF carriers uh, survived better than uh, 
control individuals when exposed to the plague. That would obviously be unethical. But one can do at least similar kinds of studies in mice. And so what one can see here, the green line represents mice that, that carry the wild type form of, of human pyrin. Uh, so, so there is some uh, protection of those mice versus normal mice that don't have any human pyrin in them. So that's the baseline that we have to use for our comparisons. The red shows mice that have one of, oops, uh, one of the um, uh, FMF mutations, and you can see that they're, they are protected. This is survival, uh, and they are protected relative to mice that, that have the wild type uh, human pyrin. What's more, if you uh, breed these uh, mice to uh, a strain of mouse that doesn't have the IL-1 receptor shown here in blue, then that protective effect goes away. And so that's showing you that the protection induced by the mutant FMF uh, allele is in fact a protection that is related to IL-1 production. And then finally, the question that I'm sure many of you are, are asking is, well, but could this really explain the high frequencies of FMF mutations that we see in the Turk Turkish population or in other populations. And so to answer that question, we actually did some simulations based on uh, what we know of when the FMF mutation would have arisen, uh, what we know in terms of when there were uh, uh, pandemics of bubonic plague. And so when there were pandemics of bubonic plague, uh, there was uh, one of them called the uh, Justinian plague uh, that went from about 541 uh, uh, AD or in the uh, common era, 541 to 767. That was the Justinian plague. And then of course the Black Death uh, started in 1346, and in the Middle East, actually, the Black Death was relatively prevalent in in, until the mid-1800s. So if you look at what happened in terms of the frequency of the M694V mutation in red and the V726A mutation in blue, you can see that both of them went up during this period of time. This is the Justinian plague that I mentioned uh, right here. And then during the period between the Justinian plague and the Black Death, it just sort of leveled out the frequency of M694V and V726A. And then during the, um, the second pandemic, which actually lasted a longer period of time, you can see that the M694V mutation, it went up to a allele frequency of 0.03, which then translates to a carrier frequency of 0.06 and the V726A went to an allele frequency of 0.02, which is a carrier frequency of 0.04. The carrier frequency is twice the allele frequency. And that actually is pretty consistent with what we see in modern day populations in terms of the frequency of FMF mutations. So in any case, what this is telling us then is that for sure, FMF associated mutations in pyrin have been under selection over uh, the centuries, and that, uh, at least from a biologic point of view, uh, we have mechanistic data that we think the bubonic plague could have done that, and uh, that is consistent with the numbers that we actually see in terms of frequencies. If you'd like to read more about this, it came out in the August issue of uh, Nature Immunology, and you can see here uh, the, uh, the paper, this is the title page of the paper. Uh, for your further uh, review if you'd like to uh, learn more about this. I'd now like to turn to our second story, which will be perhaps a little bit shorter than this one, just so that we won't uh, keep you up until midnight tonight. Uh, and this is a story about the spectrum of mucosal inflammation. And this is a story uh, that uh, stars Kalpana Manthra. Now, Kalpana actually is a... Uh, uh, a former fellow on my lab. She's now a junior faculty uh, person uh, in the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Uh, and uh, she's a first-generation American. Her uh, parents actually are from India. 
from southern India, the Bangalore area. Uh, and um, uh, she was uh, aided and abetted. She collaborated with Elaine Remmers and two other former fellows in the lab, Yohei Carino and Masaki Takeuchi. So in any case, uh, this story begins with our interest in a condition called Bechet's disease. And just to remind you with regard to Bechet's disease, Bechet's disease is not a monogenic disease like FMF, like familial Mediterranean fever. Instead, uh, Bechet's disease is a, usually a genetically complex disease where there are a number of different uh, common variants that are associated uh, with susceptibility to Bechet's disease. And of course, clinically, Bechet's disease is characterized by this triad of painful oral ulcers, ocular inflammation, this is hypopion uveitis, uh, where there's an accumulation of pus in the anterior chamber of the eye in a patient, uh, and then uh, genital ulceration. So that combination of three things are important in making the diagnosis of Bechet's disease. And um, uh, we also have the pathogy phenomenon illustrated here, in which some patients with Bechet's disease uh, will develop pustules on their skin uh, when it's pricked uh, with a sterile needle. Down here at the bottom, it says lambda sub s is greater than 10. What that means is that the probability of a sibling of someone with Bechet's disease getting Bechet's disease themselves, uh, that it's more than tenfold what it would be for uh, someone that's the sibling of a non-Bechet's uh, patient. So there's at least a tenfold increase in risk of having Bechet's disease if you're a sibling of someone who has it, indicating that there's, there are genetic factors, although, as I said, it's not usually Mendelian factors. This slide simply illustrates something that we think about a lot in terms of uh, human diseases. And along the x-axis, we have the allele frequency Along the y-axis, we have the effect size. And so what I'm saying basically is that Bechet's disease is a disease where there's common variants that have a relatively low effect size. That's the usual situation for Bechet's disease. Whereas FMF would be here, where you have fairly rare variants uh, that have a, a high effect size. Now, we started working on the genetics of Bechet's disease uh, back uh, in about 2008 or so and started publishing on it in 2010. And some of the papers that we've written about this are at the bottom of this slide. And of course, it was known uh, before we started working on Bechet's disease that HLA-B51 is associated with susceptibility to Bechet's disease. Using a genome-wide association study uh, design, uh, we were able in 2010 to show that variants of the interleukin-10 locus and the IL-23 receptor locus are associated with uh, susceptibility to Bechet's disease. And then afterwards, uh, we found several other genes that are also associated with Bechet's susceptibility. Three of them are shown uh, there uh, in this lower right-hand side. Uh, and then uh, an additional one that's very important that I'll illustrate to you on the next slide is a gene called ERAP1. Uh, there are some sort of uh, intermediate uh, frequency variants, including the FMF gene, the M M694V mutation in the FMF gene actually uh, 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 confers susceptibility to Bechet's disease. So there are a bunch of uh, medium frequency variants that are associated with Bechet susceptibility, and then a whole bunch more uh, that uh, we've found, so that altogether there are 17 different genes that we had found that are associated with Bechet susceptibility. And there even is a rare monogenic form of Bechet's disease as well, caused by mutations in TNFA IP3. Just to illustrate a couple of these, and we can't go into detail on all of them. Uh, so. Um, I said HLA-B51 is associated with Bechet's susceptibility. There are some other HLA types that are also associated with Bechet's susceptibility. Mike Umbrello in my lab uh, did that work back in 2014, and what he found was that 
that the key amino acids in the uh, class one MHC molecule that are that confer susceptibility to Bechet's disease are along the binding groove of uh, the class one molecule. So it suggests that maybe there would be some sort of an antigen that's being presented by HLA B51 and other HLA alleles that are associated with Bechet's susceptibility. What we found at about that same time was that there's uh, coding variants in this gene called ERAP1 that are also associated with Bechet's susceptibility. And that's really interesting because ERAP1 encodes a protein that lives in the endoplasmic reticulum and that's involved in trimming peptides and loading them onto class one molecules. And it turns out that the variants of ERAP1 that are associated with susceptibility to Bechet's disease only work in people who are HLA B51 positive. So it really, because of the fact that there's this epistasis, this interaction between these susceptibility alleles, it really does make one think that perhaps there are Bechetogenic uh, peptides that may be associated uh, with uh, uh, the initiation of, of Bechet's uh, episodes. With regard to the monogenic form of Bechet's disease, just one slide on that. TNFAIP3 uh, is the gene that's involved there. It encodes a protein called A20, uh, and A20 is a molecule that regulates ubiquitylation of various proteins. And ubiquitylation is a post-translational modification of proteins, and it, it uh, can have an important effect on regulating immune responses. So in this particular case, you have a, a, a cluster of proteins, a signaling complex, that's induced by tumor necrosis factor that is stabilized uh, by K63 ubiquitin, ubiquitin that is, that's linked together at lysine 63. A20 actually is a deubiquitylase for this particular uh, reaction. It removes K63 ubiquitin chains and in that way destabilizes the signaling complex and the constituent parts of it come apart and then A20 actually has a second function where it can add K48 ubiquitin chains to the uh, constituent proteins that come apart from these signaling complexes and that targets them for destruction by the proteasome. So it's a sort of a one-two punch, if you will, uh, where A20 uh, is important uh, both for destabilizing inflammatory signaling complexes and then degrading the constituent parts of the signaling complex. So you would then think that if you had a mutation in the gene that encodes A20, a loss of function mutation, that might lead to a hyperinflammatory process, which is in fact uh, what we have seen. So anyway, Three years ago, we had gotten to this point and we were very proud of ourselves in terms of having found all of these Bechet's uh, susceptibility loci. And then I went to the American Society of Human Genetics meeting. And that was quite an experience because I went to a talk by someone from 23andMe. You know, 23andMe is this company that does uh, uh, direct to consumer DNA testing. So that if you do some sort of a buckle brushing um, and send a sample to the people at 23andMe, they will do DNA sequencing and tell you um, a little bit about your ancestry and a little bit about your susceptibility to common diseases like hypertension and cardiovascular disease. But they also, apparently, I didn't know this until I went to the talk, they have a research component as well. And someone there at 23andMe was interested in, of all things, susceptibility to canker sores. Canker sores is just another name for common oral ulcers. And so they um, just, when people would send their samples to them, there was a questionnaire that went along with it. And one of the questions was, do you get fre frequent canker sores, yes or no? And there were 178,409 people uh, who said, yes, they do get frequent canker sores. And there were 66,603 who said, no, they don't. They didn't do any physical exam on these people. They didn't look at their medical records. They just took the yes or no answer to the question and did a genome-wide association study. And lo and behold, 
they found a number of loci actually that are the same as the loci that we had found that are associated with susceptibility to Bechet's disease, which is really, I found uh, very interesting that, you know, that they could do this. I mean, it was gratifying to us that they came up with, you know, some of the same answers that we had come up with in the laborious studies that we had done uh, with Ahmet Ghul uh, in Istanbul in order to figure out uh, susceptibility loci for Bechet's disease. Uh, that they would be the same as some of the susceptibility loci for just common canker sores. And then the folks at 23andMe collaborated with the UK Biobank and confirmed this in a, a larger uh, uh, cohort of patients. So then enter Kelpana Manthrum. Now Kelpana is uh, or was a fellow in my lab who was studying a disease called FAPA. FAPA stands for the syndrome of periodic fevers with aphthous stomatitis, pharyngitis, and cervical adenopathy or cer cervical adenitis, PFAPA. And some people pronounce it FAPA, other people pronounce it PFAPA, but whichever way you pronounce it, it is the most common periodic fever syndrome in children, much more common than FMF, uh, for example. Uh, and uh, it is unique in the clock-like regularity of uh, the episodes that many of the patients with FAPA have. It's certainly the most regular of any of the periodic fever syndromes in children. And so a child with FAPA will have his or her own periodicity of their episodes, which could be 29 days and, or 19 days or 25 days, whatever. But whatever it is, the parents can then predict months in advance when their child is going to have, you know, their next and the next, next and the next, next, next uh, episode. And they will be pretty spot on in terms of when those episodes will occur. So that's pretty remarkable. And we don't usually see that in diseases like FMF or TRAPS. Uh, FAPA is unique uh, for its dramatic initial response to corticosteroids. If you give a child with FAPA a dose of prednisone at the beginning of an attack, oftentimes it will abort the attack, although then oftentimes the spacing between the attacks will become shorter. It runs in families, but usually not uh, in a Mendelian pattern. And children with FAPA tend to outgrow it uh, by young adulthood, although we do in our clinic have a few patients uh, who are adults who still have episodes of FAPA. So Kalpana asked the question, well, if there are certain susceptibility loci that are in common between Bechet's disease and common canker sores. Might they also be susceptibility loci for FAPA? And so she tested that hypothesis and lo and behold, she was right. And these are four that she found that are especially strong. So the IL-12 alpha gene, which encodes the P35 subunit of interleukin-12, is associated with susceptibility to FAPA and the odds ratio is 2.3, which is actually quite substantial. And for a complex disease, that's really pretty good in terms of an odds ratio. But she also saw uh, for STAT4, interleukin-10, and CCR1, CCR3, uh, that again, uh, there was a susceptibility uh, association there uh, with very uh, substantial odds ratios associated with, with each of them. And so that led Kalpana to propose the idea of Bechet's spectrum disorders, that there's a spectrum of diseases with common susceptibility loci with Bechet's disease, whoops, uh, at the uh, severe end of the uh, uh, spectrum, FAPA in the middle, and recurrent oral ulcers at the mild end of the spectrum. And Kalpana looked uh, in FAPA patients uh, to see whether or not uh, IL-12 um, uh, uh, positivity uh, as, as measured uh, by uh, flow cytometry uh, would be uh, increased uh, during flares and found that in fact, uh, the CD14 monocytes uh, from FAPA patients uh, do express more of the P35, P40, uh, two-chain IL-12 uh, protein uh, during flares than not during flares, and that's more than control individuals. And if you look at just uh, 
individuals from the blood bank uh, who have either the uh, risk allele, two copies of the risk allele, or one copy or no copies of the risk allele, that in fact uh, the amount of IL-12 produced in vitro uh, upon stimulation uh, correlates with the amount of, with the number of risk alleles uh, uh, that uh, that person uh, expresses. And so uh, Kelpina also looked at HLA associations. She, of course, uh, replicated the HLA B51 association in Bechet's disease with an odds ratio of three. She found that for FAPA patients, though, there's a substantial HLA association of class two molecules uh, with an odds ratio of around two. And for recurrent aphthous ulcers, she and others have found that there's a mild, a weak association with a, a class two uh, uh, allele. And so the stronger HLA associations are uh, uh, associated with the more severe end of the spectrum. And this is just the title page of the, um, the paper that Kalpana published in the PNAS in June, uh, uh, describing this uh, new concept of Bechet spectrum diseases. And of course, the idea is that, that uh, FAPA is just on the spectrum of uh, Bechet's spectrum disorders, and that it's, it's within this range of normal, if you will, which extends into the abnormal. Okay, so then the third story, and we're getting towards the end anyway. Uh, and this is a story that I think is really interesting. It's not exactly a story that you guys uh, as pediatricians uh, would perhaps uh, immediately resonate with, but I think that from a mechanistic point of view, it's something that is certainly worth your hearing about and knowing about. And this is a story about reversing the paradigm of discovery. And uh, the person who is responsible for this is uh, a person who's still a fellow in my lab, a scholar in my lab, as we call them, uh, David Beck, uh, who uh, is a uh, human genetics uh, fellow, clinical fellow in the lab. Uh, and then he's collaborated with Peter Grayson, Marcy Ferrato, uh, Amanda Umbrello, and Patricia Hoffman uh, in doing uh, this work. And so the, the question that these guys were interested in is the question of how can we figure out the cause of autoinflammatory disease amongst more of our patients than what we have. So I have this clinic at the NIH where we have patients who have autoinflammatory diseases. That's what I study. Um, and we have about 3,000 patients who have enrolled uh, in this uh, clinic overall. And we have a molecular explanation, a genetic explanation, on about 1,000 of them. So for 2,000 of them, we don't have an explanation. And you know, we try our best to figure it out for more patients, and we've found some new diseases over the years. And so that's been good, but we still have a bunch of patients where we haven't figured it out. And so David was then thinking about, well, how can we do better? What can we do to uh, figure out more of these patients? And the usual way that we would do it amongst our 2,000 undiagnosed patients would be to say, okay, well, let's see if we can find a few of them that share something in common, um, you know, a certain kind of arthritis or a certain kind of rash or a certain periodicity of their fevers, whatever. And that then we might do exome sequencing or some other kind of genetic analysis to find some genetic factor that would be in common amongst those individuals. And that could, if we're lucky, define a new disease. That's how we usually do it. But David uh, instead had this idea of genotype first. And so the idea that he had was that he's interested in ubiquitylation. This is a, a biochemical process that, in, uh, that occurs inside cells. I already mentioned it with regard to A20, uh, that basically ubiquitylation is a very important process that regulates a number of different uh, uh, signaling, immunologic signaling uh, uh, pathways uh, inside the cell. And we've already found some autoinflammatory diseases that are caused by mutations in ubiquitylation genes. Haploinsufficiency of A20 is one of them, otolopenia is another. 
So he thought that, well, we'll just make a list of all of the genes that are associated with ubiquitolation, regulating ubiquitolation. And he came up with a list of 841 genes. So his idea was that he was going to look at each of these 841 genes in the exomes of a bunch of undiagnosed patients. And so he had 1,477 exomes from our autoinflammatory cohort. And just to <laughs> embellish things even further, he had 1,083 exomes from the NIH undiagnosed diseases cohort. So altogether, 2,560 exomes. And the idea was that he was going to take each of these 841 ubiquitolation genes and look in the 2,560 exomes and see if he could find any variants that looked suspicious and variants that might define a subgroup of the patients. And so basically, he was then looking for variants in genes with a PLI of greater than 0.9. That means genes that are pretty intolerant to variation. Variants that are not present in NOMAD, which is a database of, of uh, mutations uh, in humans that has over 100,000 people in it. And these would be variants that are shared amongst cases. And so what did he find? Well, he found three middle-aged men who are heterozygous for mutations at position 41 of a gene called UBA1. Middle-aged men that are heterozygous for mutations at position 41 of UBA1. Now, you know, you could have various reactions to that. One reaction would be, great, he found something. Another would be, he only found three people. Uh, but then the third reaction, which would be actually the most appropriate, is this doesn't make sense. And the reason that it doesn't make sense, that is not obvious from what I've told you so far, but it will be once I clue you in, uh, is that UBA1 is a gene that's encoded on the X chromosome. So, of course, nearly all men have only one copy of the X chromosome. So how in the world could these three middle-aged men be heterozygous, in other words, have two different forms of a gene that's encoded on the X chromosome, where the, presumably they only have one copy of that gene? Doesn't make sense. And in fact, usually the sequence analysis software would throw that out as a likely sequencing error. But David Beck is a very persist, persistent guy. And he looked at that and he said, well, there could be other explanations for that. It could be because of aneuploidy. He looked for that, you know, that maybe the person had an extra X chromosome, but they didn't. Um, or it could be because of mosaicism, because in fact, there was a mutation that arose after birth uh, in the individual, just in a subset of the person's cells. And that the reason why they look heterozygous is that they really have two subpopulations of cells, one of which has the mutation and the other of which does not. So that was his hypothesis. And so he looked at that. And of course, you know, we get the DNA from the blood. So you would think that maybe this would be going on in the blood. And for these three middle-aged men, what he found was that, in fact, the bone marrow cells did have two versions of the uh, of the UBA1 gene. Wild type is shown in red here. Mutant is shown in blue. And you can see that, maybe you can see, that there's both a red peak and a blue peak there in the hematopoietic uh, precursor cells. What's more, in the peripheral blood, there's both a red peak and a blue peak. However, if we then look at the different subpopulations of blood cells, one can see the red peak and blue peak in megakaryocytes and erythroblasts, whoops, uh, you can see a red peak and a blue peak in the myeloid cells in neutrophils and monocytes, but you only see a red peak uh, in the uh, T cells and B cells and the lymphocytes. And so, in fact, he was right. He was right uh, that, uh, in fact, um, uh, 
in the peripheral blood there's a mixture of cells, some of which have the mutations, some of which don't. And then, of course, the other question you'd be asking is, well, what about fibroblasts? What about some other kind of cell? Do fibroblasts have the mutation? No, they do not. And lymphocytes do not, but all of these myeloid cells do have the mutation. This is just frequency of mutation along the uh, y-axis. So that was really interesting. But what I'm about to tell you is incredible. Fact, stranger than fiction. So what happened then? was that we went to the hematopathology department and met with Dr. Calvo, who's the NIH hematopathologist, one of them. And she was looking at the bone marrows with us. And she said, well, gee, look, there's all of these vacuoles in the precursor cells from these patients, from all three of the patients that, that uh, had the mutations in UBA1. And she was saying, these are quite pe peculiar. You don't see these very often. I know I've seen them before, but I just don't remember where. So in any case, then we came back to see her again a few days later. And she had a couple of reports in her hand. And she very ceremoniously plopped them into my hands and said, Dan, I remembered where I've seen these uh, vacuoles before. Here's the reports of the patients. These are your patients, Dan, from eight years ago. You ought to go back and check these patients and see if they have mutations in this gene too. So we did go back to check whether those two patients had uh, UBA1 mutations. They were both from middle-aged men and both of them had UBA1 mutations. And when we checked, both of them uh, are uh, somatic mutations where there's, uh, uh, there's basically a, a mixture of cells, uh, some with the mutation and some without the mutation. So, so that was really interesting. One of those patients turned out to have relapsing polychondritis. And so that led us to go to Peter Grayson uh, and Marcy Ferrada at the NIH who are following a cohort of patients with relapsing polychondritis. And sure enough, some of their patients with relapsing polychondritis, uh, besides the one that we had found there, also have mutations in UBA1. One thing led to another, and we now have and published uh, in the New England Journal, it's, it's out online, but not yet in print. Um, it came out actually on October 27th, the day that David Beck presented this at the American Society of Human Genetics meeting. Uh, we have 25 patients, all of them middle-aged men, uh, all of them uh, who are uh, somatic mosaics uh, for mutations in UBA1. And here is the summary of this cohort of, of men. You can see that the age of onset ranges from, whoops, from 45 to 80. This is a severe disease. 40% of these patients have died of their illness. Fever, skin involvement that looks like sweet syndrome, neutrophilic pulmonary infiltrates, chondritis, venous thromboembolism, macrocytic anemia, and bone marrow vacuoles are some of the major features. And you can see that these patients uh, met diagnostic criteria for a number of different rheumatologic or hematologic diseases, ranging from relapsing polychondritis to sweet syndrome to myelodysplastic syndrome, multiple myeloma, polyarteritis nodosa, giant cell arteritis. So this is neat. And I'm sorry if it's you know uh, already 10 o'clock on Friday night and I'm telling you that this is neat, but it is. Because, you know, here what David Beck did was that he took this genotype first approach and found individuals who have mutations in this UBA1 gene. And these individuals had a whole bunch of different clinical diagnoses before, you know, we realized that they all had mutations in the UBA1 gene. But in fact, they have a disease that's defined by mutations in the UBA1 gene, and, and we can sort of take them out <laughs> of the cohorts of relapsing polychondritis or polyarteritis nodosa or whatever, and put them into their own category. So it's as if we're defining a new disease 
by starting with a gene rather than the other way around, which is what I told you we usually do, of starting with patients that have something clinically in common and then find a gene. Here, we're just going from a gene where we think it might be uh, uh, interesting to defining a, a set of patients with different clinical diagnoses that all have something in common uh, genetically. And so we call that disease Vexus, V-E-X-A-S, which rhymes with Texas, and it is an acronym for vacuoles, E1 activating enzyme, which is uh, uh, what UBA1 encodes. It's X-linked, it's autoinflammatory, uh, and it's somatic. If you look at the um, uh, neutrophils from these patients and compare them with healthy neutrophils, you can see that they have whole, they look like this is what neutrophils look like when they're about to die. So they really look sick. They look bad. Uh, and if you look uh, at uh, various uh, inflammatory gene expression profiles, you can see that in fact in the whole blood or neutrophils or monocytes, you have uh, an inflammatory signature, you don't have that inflammatory signature in lymphocytes, which as I mentioned, don't harbor the mutation. We think that the lymphocytes that have the mutation die off before we can ever see them. Now in terms of this uh, UBA1 gene, what does it encode? It encodes a protein that is an E1 enzyme. And just to briefly mention the ubiquitylation process, it involves an E1 enzyme, uh, which actually um, uh, picks up a ubiquitin molecule. It transfers it to an E2 protein, which then adds it to a target protein. And these uh, various proteins that are involved in this are called E1, E2, and E3. There's only two E1 enzymes, and UBA1 is a critical enzyme. It basically it it does most of the almost all of the UBA one all of the E one work uh, in the ubiquitylation process. Now, what about the mutations? I told you that that the mutations are all at a particular place in the UBA one protein, and the UBA one protein is drawn out here. Uh, it has a nuclear localization signal. It has um, actually there are mutations in another part of the protein that can cause spinal muscle muscular atrophy. But the mutations that are associated with Vexus are at position 41. And there's a methionine at position 1, uh, which is a start site for translation. And if you get starting there, then you do have the nuclear localization signal and you get a long form of the protein that goes to the nucleus. If you start at position 41, that's after the nuclear localization signal, so that you have a form of the protein, oops, uh, that, uh, that doesn't have a nuclear localization signal. It's a little bit shorter and it goes to the cytoplasm. And what I said is that the mutations are at position 41 so that you don't get that methionine 41. So you would not necessarily get the cytoplasmic form of the protein. And this just illustrates UBA1A is the long nuclear form, UBA1B is the shorter cytoplasmic form. So then if we look to see, well, what's going on in the cells of patients, you can see here, and by the way, I know I'm five minutes over, I'll be done in about five minutes. So, uh, and I'm happy, as I said before, to answer questions for up to an hour, hour and a half. Um, so if you look at either control cells or patient cells, Oops. Uh, and you look at CD3 positive T cells. So the T cells, remember I said, they don't have the mutation. And you have UBA1A, the UBA1A band in the patients and the controls. And you have a UBA1B that's the cytoplasmic form in the patients and the controls. So basically that's just telling us that the lymphocytes are normal. On the other hand, if we look at CD14 positive cells, those are the monocytes. And if you look in the controls, you can see where the A band would be. And you can see that you still get the A band. This is the nuclear form in the patients. But in the controls, here's the B band, but you don't have the B band in the patients. 
in their uh, 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 monocytes. Uh, instead, you have a lower band, which is here, which is UBA1C. So UBA1C is actually starting the translation at the next methionine down in the protein, which, uh, uh, which happens to be at position 67. So it makes a slightly smaller protein and it's not functionally very active. And so you get uh, less ubiquitin in the cell, less polyubiquitin because uh, basically that's not a functional form of UBA1. You get more free ubiquitin in the cell and you get evidence for activated cellular stress shown here. Um, so then if we do this in a transfection system uh, with 293 T cells, you can see here are the three different mutations at position 41 and you get you don't get the UBA1B band, but you do get the UBA1C band. Now, remember I told you that I thought, we thought that the UBA1C starts at position 67. So if that's the case, then we should be able to introduce a mutation into position 67, and that would make the C band go away, and it does. So that, that was uh, confirmation to us that our idea was right. And so then, if we look at the functional effect of that, here, just looking at the right-hand side, that this is UBA1B, this lane here. Uh, and here, this is showing that ATP is present. And ATP would then allow for the formation of this complex of, of E1 and ubiquitin. And you can see that for UBA1B, oops, most of it actually has ubiquitin bound to it. In other words, this is the normal UBA1B, and it's highly charged, if you will, uh, with ubiquitin. UBA1C, on the other hand, uh, is uncharged. It, it's non-functional. It doesn't pick up a ubiquitin chain. And that's just shown here down uh, as a histogram, UBA1A, uh, uh, basically has a lot of activity. Uh, UBA1B has a lot of activity. UBA1C does not have a lot of activity. What's more, we developed a zebrafish model of this disease, and, and that's shown here. Um, so these are zebrafish, normal zebrafish, with normal amounts of neutrophils in them. If you get rid of UBA1 altogether, you don't have very many neutrophils. If you get rid of just UBA1A, it's still okay. But if you get rid of UBA1B, you get a reduced number of neutrophils. And that's just shown here. Uh, the blue is getting rid of all of UBA1. The green is getting rid of UBA1B. Uh, so in both cases, that's reducing the number of neutrophils a lot. But uh, if you get rid of UBA1A, it doesn't have much of an effect. And in terms of the inflammatory process, that's shown on this slide. So that, for example, for TNF-alpha, if you get rid of all of UBA1, you get a lot of, of TNF being produced. If you get rid of uh, just the UBA1B, you have a lot of TNF being produced. But if you get rid of UBA1A, you don't get a lot of TNF being produced. So again, that's saying that mutation at position 41 is, is key to developing this inflammatory process. And then this slide just shows it to you in a different way. Wild type UBA1 leads to the production of normal amounts of the purple nuclear UBA1A and normal amounts of the cytoplasmic yellow UBA1B. The mutations at position 41 don't have any effect on the nuclear UBA1A, uh, but do have an effect leading to the production of a uh, uh, non-functional or very reduced in function UBA1C shown in green. So Vexus, the big picture. Using a genotype first strategy, one can define new illnesses based on genetic variants shared among patients carrying distinct clinical diagnoses. This may give rise to a new molecular taxonomy of rheumatic disease. Second, 
Somatic variants for genes encoded on the X chromosome are probably underrecognized. In other words, a lot of times the uh, software that are there to analyze the data uh, throw those uh, X chromosome mutations, somatic mutations out as being sequencing errors. And then finally, somatic mutation may account for a significant fraction of adult onset, and who knows, maybe some pediatric onset uh, inflammatory disease. This is the title page of, of the paper in the New England Journal that uh, came out online on October 27th. You can see David Beck uh, as the, uh, the first author, Peter Grayson as the, uh, the last author. And uh, there was an accompanying editorial uh, by Efrat Levy Lahad and Mary Claire King on the importance of somatic mutation in human disease, which uh, puts it into perspective in a way similar to what I've tried to explain to you now. Um, so coming back to the title of the talk, Rheumatic Disease and the Human Experience. Well, the first story I told you was that in some cases, immune variants that confer protection against infectious agents may also cause autoimmune or autoinflammatory diseases. Second, genetically complex human disease resides on a continuum, as we saw with Bechet's and uh, uh, aptus ulcers and FAPA, that extends from the range of normal experience to life-threatening illness. And then finally, somatic mutation is an inevitable part of life. In fact, we know that it's very important in the pathogenesis of cancer. And what I'm telling you is that it may be very important in the pathogenesis of rheumatic diseases as well and may lead to serious rheumatic disease. Here uh, are the, the culprits uh, that uh, were involved in a lot of this work. I've already shown you the picture of some of these people. Of course, these photos were taken uh, before the pandemic when it was okay for people to get together in a group. Uh, this is my lab, and this is uh, my clinical team. Uh, here are a number of our collaborators that contributed to all of this work. Ahmet Ghul was particularly important. He's uh, 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 at Istanbul uh, University and uh, got a lot of the blood samples for us uh, that we used both in the studies of FMF history uh, and also uh, Bechet's disease. Seiza Ozen uh, was an important collaborator. Jay Che uh, went to her lab in order to get uh, blood samples uh, from a number of patients with FMF as well as the patients that we had from the NIH. Jim Bliska is an expert on uh, Yersinia pestis that was an important collaborator in, in all of these studies. And then a number of people from the NIH who also contributed enormously uh, to this study. And then finally, uh, a photo of the clinical center of the NIH. Uh, this is the, uh, the teaching hospital uh, of, of the NIH where all of... Uh, our patients are seen uh, in the auto-inflammatory uh, cohort, uh, and my research lab is down in the basement uh, over here, uh, just in case uh, you want to know. And if you would like to email me or uh, my colleagues uh, with regard to referrals, uh, certainly that would be fine. Uh, you can just email me, and I can direct the referral to the right place, dan.kastner at nih.gov. Uh, is my email address. And with that, I will call it to a close. I apologize to you for going 15 minutes over, but I figured since this is the end of the day, uh, that probably uh, that would be at least somewhat acceptable. And I hope that uh, this has been interesting and enjoyable and perhaps a little educational to you all as well. So with that, I'll call it to a close. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm happy to try to answer uh, any questions uh, if you have them. Thank, thank you, thank you, Dr. Kastner, for that excellent narration of excellent deliberation about the auto-inflammatory process and its vivid manifestations. There are some questions in chat box. I will read it for you. Okay. One is the first question is by Dr. Amit Travat. I think it's a long question, Dr. Amit. Please unmute yourself and ask the question direct, directly. Dr. Amit, you can unmute. Yeah. Okay. Can you, can you hear me? 
yeah, yes, yeah, indeed. Yeah. yeah. Uh, fantastic talk, uh, Dr. Ka uh, Kasna. So I, I would like to know while it is true that uh, uh, the pyrene, uh, the uh, MEF variants, they do have uh, irrefutable, uh, irrefutably they protect against Yersinia. My, my, I'm just curious that why were they selected only in these selected populations? Why were they not? Uh, because Yersinia has been known to affect uh, populations across the world through ancient times. So why were why are these why are these variants in such high frequency only in these eastern uh, Mediterranean population? Why were they not propagated along the Silk Route to other populations? Uh, well, and that's. Across, uh, and uh, was it because of high consanguinity in these populations? Could that be one of the reasons? That's a, it's a wonderful question. It's a great question. And uh, in the interest of time, I didn't go into uh, the uh, detail that I would have uh, in order to uh, address that question. But now that you're asking it, uh, we can uh, go into that, uh, that question. And that is that if you look at people, modern day people who have FMF, and you look at the haplotype, that's associated with the M694V mutation or the V726A mutation, or for that matter, the M6ABI mutation. Those are the three major mutations that are associated with FMF. Actually, by haplotype analysis, all of the modern day people uh, who have FMF have the same haplotype, uh, have a haplotype that uh, can be traced back to ancestors that lived in the Middle East. And so um, I think that it is probably just a coincidence that those mutations happen to arise in the Middle East and that um, plague was present in the Middle East uh, during the period of time when those mutations were already present in those populations. And so it was selected for there. Um, you're quite right that plague uh, is something that, you know, is a uh, fairly uh, worldwide uh, infection. And so you might think that, well, uh, one would also see um, these mutations being uh, selected for in China or in Japan or wherever. Uh, but in, in point of fact, those mutations were not present in China and Japan at the time that plague uh, was present. So it's 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 the combination, and you know, of course, the, this is oftentimes the case that you know we're having to think about gene environment uh, interactions that involve uh, a number of factors that are are interacting, and so you know we have the interaction between. Pyron and Yersinia pestis that I uh, tried to explain to you, but also uh, one has uh, uh, the fact that the mutations just didn't happen to arise everywhere in the world. Now, now of course, um, in the Ashkenazi Jewish population, which is a, a population that eventually did um, migrate to Eastern Europe, there there is a, a uh, a high frequency of the V726A mutation. And so that is a, an example of where uh, the mutation is uh, more common in, in another part of the world. Uh, but the V726A, the haplotype that's associated with the V726A is the same haplotype as what you can see in the Druze population, actually, uh, in uh, the Middle East. The Druze are a, uh, a religious group that live in the mountains of Lebanon and, and uh, uh, other places around Israel. I, I visited some Druze villages back in the late 1980s when I was doing the FMF positional cloning project. And, and the Druze have been uh, isolated for the last thousand years, at least. It's a very uh, isolated society. Uh, but yet, the Druze have the very same haplotype associated with V726A as do uh, Ashkenazi Jewish people. So it's it's an interesting thing where you know there is this this history uh, that appears to be associated with it as well. Okay, okay sir. Uh, Dr. Yeah. Amit Agarwal, madam, is also uh, willing to ask some questions. 
So, <laughs> so Okay, so Dan, I had the same question. It's a wonderful talk, and I had the same question that why has these findings been replicated in any other population where plague was prevalent? That you have answered. So, corollary to that, has any other inflammasome gene related disease selection has been linked to any other microbe? Like here, we have shown for the pyrene gene. So would it be applicable to other genes in the inflammasome pathway that they have been selected because of other microbe? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So, um, so far, we don't know of any other. Um, and, you know, uh, I don't think that one can say that mutations in any of the other inflammasome proteins are all that common in any population. You know, you look at NLRP3, you know, which of course uh, is sort of the most famous inflammasome, if you will, but the diseases that are associated with NLRP3 mutations, familial cold autoinflammatory syndrome, Muckle Wells syndrome, and NOMAD, those are all pretty rare diseases. And so, you know, th there hasn't apparently been any selection associated with them. Of course, you know, the other thing is that you have to find a disease that, you know, is just right in terms of being uh, a disease that, that uh, could still allow people to live long enough that they would have the disease or a disease that that looks recessively inherited too you know because uh, basically what you're what works the best is is if you have people who are heterozygous carriers have a selective advantage and people who have two copies of the gene have the disease which may in some cases be lethal you know, for NLRP3, one copy of, of the mutation is sufficient to cause disease. And at least for a disease like NOMAD, it's, it's a very severe early onset disease where you wouldn't survive very long with that. So, so FMF is special, you know, in the sense that, that uh, you have this uh, apparent recessive inheritance. The reason I say apparent recessive inheritance is that in fact, there are some people that have one copy of the mutation that, that can have clinical symptoms, but most people with FMF do have two copies of the mutation. So it does behave more or less as a recessive. And these selective advantage things work best for the recessive uh, traits. You know, So uh, another famous example that's not inflammasome related would be sickle cell. You know, So sickle cell, the carriers for the hemoglobin S uh, mutation have resistance to malaria. Uh, and if you have two copies of, of the hemoglobin S mutation, then you have sickle cell anemia, which up until uh, recent times could lead to very early death. But you know, the, so why, why would you have selection for it? And it's the same processes with FMF, the carriers far outnumber the people who are affected. Because let us, let us just say, as a simple example, an easy example to think about, that the carrier frequency in a population, just this is just for example, uh, let's say the carrier frequency is 20% in a population. Okay, so that's a high carrier frequency, as I was saying before. If the carrier frequency is 20%, the allele frequency, just by math, is half of that. It's 10%. And then the affected frequency is the square of the allele frequency. So if the allele frequency is 10%, then the affected frequency is 1%. So you've got, in this example, 20% of the population are carriers and would be protected against whatever disease it is that we're thinking about. 1% of the population would be homozygous, or two copies of the mutation, and would have some disease that would be lethal to them. So, so it's a good bargain in terms of evolution. You know, The population loses 1% of people who have a terrible disease, but 20% of the population are protected against some bad infection, you know? So, so that's why 
these things happen, you know, is that if you have a disease that's recessive. And so, you know, if you think about the inflammasome diseases, NLRP3, those are, those are dominantly inherited diseases. NLRC4, also, it's usually de novo and dominantly inherited, you know, so, so I think that that's what we're dealing with too. So there's special circumstances that have to be present in order uh, for this to work. Okay, sir. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Dr. Suma, please put your... Yeah. Hello, uh, Dan, that was a fantastic talk. Uh, I really enjoyed it, especially the last recount of uh, moving from genotype to diagnosis. That was very interesting. Um, actually, my question was, why isn't HLA B51 in the diagnostic criteria for Betchitz? Because, I mean, I, I live in Kerala, and uh, we are on the old silk route. And we do get to see quite a few patients with, uh, you know, form fraste of uh, Betchitz. And mm -hmm. while you get to see some patients who actually, uh, childhood pediatric Betchitz as well, while you tend to see, you know, uh, some children who can actually fulfill any of, you know, any of the diagnostic criteria, there are several children I see who have maybe one major component and a B51 to go with it. Mm -hmm. um, they do not have uh, enough criteria to actually make a diagnosis. And uh, the question is, what relevance to the, do I give the B51 here? So I have the children who come with severe visual uh, threat, threatened retinal vasculitis bilateral mm -hmm. and no other features whatsoever. And they've got a B51. I had a, uh, you know, a one-year-old infant with severe aphthysalsis, oral ulcers. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, very significant uh, high frequency uh, occurring oral ulcers who was B51. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then there are, I have two children who actually presented with um, a PO, pyrexia of unknown origin. And on investigation, they actually had um, aortic dilatation mm -hmm. and uh, thickening of the aortic wall, uh, we, who both have a B51. And uh, so the question is, what label should you give these people? And um, how do we explain, I mean, how do we actually characterize these kind of diagnosis? That's a wonderful question. And, you know, I think that you're really getting at what Kalpana uh, is getting at with regard to there being a spectrum of disease that is in this Betchet spectrum. And, and you know, for the purposes of the, the criteria, you know, the, like the ISG criteria, for example, for Betchett's disease, those criteria were developed at least to some extent, you know, so that clinical trials could be done and you would know that, you know, all of the patients that were yeah. in one group, you know, met criteria or whatever. And the criteria don't necessarily always work so well, you know, when you're on the front lines as a clinician, and having to think about what's going on with the patient. And I guess that Kalpana's point, or a major point that she's making, is that really this is a spectrum of disease and that you have to think about the biology here and that you know there are probably a, a number of genes that are involved. And uh, maybe eventually we will redefine things. You know, we'll use a different nomenclature rather than just saying that somebody either has Betchett's or not, you know, that maybe we will recognize Betchett's spectrum disorder. I will say that, you know, with regard to your question of B51, B51 is not the only uh, HLA class one that yes. is associated with Betchett's. And there are several others. B15 is one of them. I, I don't remember them all, to be honest yes. with you. But, uh, you know, in that Mike Umbrello paper from 2014, it goes through all of them that are associated, or there's even some that are protective. Um, so, you know, I would, you know, for, for your patients that you're talking about, you know, like a patient that's B51 positive, and has uh, uh, vision-threatening uveitis. If I were you and I, and of course, you know, part of the issue is, is it available? But if you could, I probably would be treating that patient with a TNF inhibitor, you know, yes. in the hope 
of uh, preventing visual loss in that patient yes. because it's probably the same pathophysiology, even though the patient doesn't meet you know, the ISG criteria for Bechet's disease, but it's probably the same biological process. We have found actually that you know, for the oral ulcers, um, we see, you know, we're sort of a referral center for a bunch of different kinds of things. And so both kids and adults who have very, very severe oral ulcers oftentimes get sent to us. And at least some of them do respond to TNF inhibitors as well. A premolast is another yeah. agent uh, that yes. you know sometimes, at least for the oral ulcers, yes. works reasonably well uh, in these patients. And and we've found that a premolast is an inhibitor, among other things, it's an inhibitor of IL-12. You know, which Kalpana found to be an important susceptibility locus. Uh, you know, for this mm. Bechet spectrum uh, disease. So, so I think that we have to think a little bit more broadly about these kinds of things. And I think that the, the classification system will evolve, you know, as we understand a little bit more about these things too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. CK, sir. Sir, please unmute yourself. Sir, unmute yourself, sir. Yes. Can you hear? Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Now, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, yeah. indeed. It's yeah. Okay. Okay. yeah I, I again want to uh, talk about an uh, uh, additional message we had very recently. A year old child who had all the inflammatory markers and he suddenly went into intestinal perforation. Once operated, it had nine perforations in the small intestine. We had to uh, forego the almost 30 centimeters of intestine, we had to do a, I mean, uh, ileostomy, and he was uh, uh, reoperated three days back. Now, the point is, he had only one ulcer in the gum, only one ulcer and high fever. No other markers, no CNS manifestations, no genital lesions, no eye problem, nothing he had. So only the intestinal manifestation, very, very unusual. And uh, we could uh, make a diagnosis by the histopathology examinations. Mm -hmm. That is one. Second question I would, I would like to ask you is, do you recommend the use of chloropine in uh, children coming with rheumatic valvulitis? Because it's a problem in developing countries. Whatever uh, precaution you take, then you continue to them, they go for... Uh, uh, derange uh, the valvular damage and uh, get it long problem for them. Suppose, as it is being uh, recognized now, the use of chloroquine, uh, how long you should use it, what's the dose you recommend in those situations? Thank you. All right. Well, so the first question of, um, and I, the connection wasn't real good, but I, I take it that this was a child who had as the only manifestation was uh, intersusception and uh, uh, intestinal perforations. Um, and the question is, uh, what's going on in that, in that patient? And, you know, um, I would be very interested if, if um, you were able to provide it uh, in doing DNA sequencing on that patient and the patient's parents, uh, because, there could be a number of different mutations and different genes that could lead to that. And so it could be, for example, uh, uh, a gene that's in the IL-10 pathway uh, that could be involved in these kinds of uh, processes. And so, you know, if, if there's some way that we could arrange for you to send um, DNA specimens to us, or you can do it in India, I'm, you know, if, if you have uh, someone that wants to do it there, that's totally okay with me, but we'd be happy to do that for you uh, to try to figure that out and see if, if there could be a molecular explanation. Because a lot of times when you have these kinds of unusual presentations, you know, where it's just intestinal, for example, you know, it, it could be... Already, that... already I'm in uh, contact with Dr. Gida on this issue. She has collected mm -hmm. the samples for the sequencing. 
and okay. uh, the B, actually B5 in this boy was negative. Mm -hmm. What was negative? I'm sorry, I didn't hear what was negative. Something was negative, but I didn't hear what it was. I think it's some connection problem is there. Yeah, uh, but you know, I'd, I'd be happy if, if we can't reestablish the connection to do an okay. email with, with him okay, afterwards. Um, this is the last question, sir. Uh, okay. This is from uh, Dr. Sumida Danda. Will this somatic mutation in UBA1 be detectable in peripheral blood DNA? Absolutely, yes it is. Um, and and um, at least so far, the people that we've seen who have it are all middle-aged elderly men. Uh, but at this point, you know, the, the paper had 25 uh, patients in it, I mentioned, and, and, you know, there's a table of them in the paper. Um, but uh, we're now aware of 70 patients with this, just, you know, since we started talking about it. So this is going to turn out to be a fairly common thing, I think, at least in adults. Um, and uh, so, yes, it is detectable in peripheral blood. And the, the variant allele frequency, at least amongst the patients that we've seen, is pretty high. You know, it's like 50%. So it's not like, you know, only 1% or 2% or something like that of the cells in the peripheral blood have the mutation. It's a lot of them, uh, at least in, in these patients that have clinical findings. It's a, it's quite a, uh, now, of course, you know, it must start out as a low percentage. And it may be that eventually, you know, we will find patients that have low percentages and we're looking for them now, but at least so far, all of the patients that we've seen with it uh, have had pretty high variant allele fractions. Uh, okay. Okay. So Dr. Kishore. Oh, hi, Prof. Kastner. Okay, you're audible, Kishore. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, you're audible. Yeah. yeah, Prof. Kastner, it was an absolute pleasure to kind of listen to you again. I had just listened to your talk at press. It was so um, uplifting for us. Um, uh, and then um, I've met you a couple of times at the yes, ESAID sir. meetings. I work with uh, uh, Elizabeth McDermott. We do our auto-inflammatory clinics together in Nottingham. But as, as yes. always, it's been an absolute pressure. We've met a few times, but uh, and you've been very kind with your email queries and when I, you've always been very prompt in responding and stuff. But I think that that was an inspiring presentation. Thank you very much. Well, that's very kind of you to say. And I really, really appreciate that. And, and uh, Elizabeth McDermott, so, uh, uh, so gee, uh, she goes back to traps days uh, with us uh, in the UK. We still have our big cohort, and I think uh, new and new members of that family are getting diagnosed almost by the day. There are two more who were diagnosed in the last year who are under my care. Um, wow. Gotta, wow. Thank you. Thank well, you, that's Kishore. fantastic. Fantastic. Okay, okay. Dr. Geeta Govindaraj, the main, the chief coordinator of this program, also put some questions in the chat box. I requested to ask it directly and also requested to conclude the session. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Kastner. That was a fantastic presentation. Uh, just two very simple questions. Uh, okay. Uh, do we really now know for sure what causes this regular periodicity? So some patients often tell us that it's just like menstrual periods. So what exactly underlies this exact periodicity in a few of these um, recurrent fever syndromes like PFAP and uh, uh, cyclic neutropenia. And uh, the second question is, why do some of these auto-inflammatory syndromes get better with age, like hyper-IGD syndrome? And some of them, like traps, seem to get worse with age. Do we have an answer? Uh, very simple questions. Yeah, well, they're simple questions to ask, not so simple to answer. Uh, <laughs> yes, it would be uh, what I would say uh, with regard to that. So the first question uh, with regard to the periodicity and how, how can it be that some of the episodes, at least for some patients, that the uh, um, uh, episodes are very, very predictable in terms of their periodicity, like 
for PFOP uh, and uh, uh, perhaps uh, other diseases as well. And um, I must say that we don't have a good explanation for that. Kalpana uh, and I have talked a lot about the periodicity of, of PFAPA. And uh, she has a theory uh, about, uh, about this that has to do with the fact that one of the subunits of IL-12 is also a subunit of IL-35. And, um, and it may be that what one sees is something where, at least for part of the, the, uh, uh, the, the cycle, uh, that the uh, subunit is associated with the other subunit of IL-12, and then at some point it alternates to the other subunit of IL-35, which is a suppressive cytokine. And she's worked on that a little bit, but at this point doesn't have enough data to say for sure. But it could be that a year from now or two years from now, Kalpana will have the answer for you. Um, and she's working on it, you know, as one of the things that she's working on anyway. So that's, that's an interesting question. And then you raised the question of, you know, at least for some um, women of childbearing age that the episodes can uh, in some way coincide with the menstrual cycle. And yeah, I mean, in some way there is a connection there. And, and it used to be, you know, before colchicine was recognized as a treatment for FMF, that uh, women with severe attacks of FMF would be put on oral contraceptives as a way of trying to sort of even out the, um, uh, the hormonal uh, milieu. But again, we don't really understand that very well. And, you know, we, we thought that we were going to be so smart. You know, that's always the way is that you think you're so smart and then you learn that you're not actually. Um, so we, we made these knock-in mice, you know, that have FMF mutations. And the knock-in mice, they do have inflammation, no question about that, but, but it's not periodic. <laughs> and so it didn't help us at all. You know, we thought that, that, you know, with the mice that, you know, we could then do various studies that you couldn't do in humans. Um, and in fact, the, the uh, fevers are not periodic. Now, of course, mice don't have a menstrual cycle. You know, they have an estrus cycle. And so maybe that's, the, maybe that's why the mice don't have, uh, uh, you know, periodicity of their fevers. I just thought of this as I was answering your question. <laughs> maybe that's the reason why the mice don't have periodicity. I don't know. Uh, but, you know, that's the kind of question that you might, try to answer with an, you know, a animal model. Um, so that's one thing. And then, you know, the question of, well, why do some patients outgrow the episodes with age? For hyper IgD syndrome, I don't know. Uh, for uh, FAPA, you know, where again, patients do seem to, most of them do outgrow it. It, I think has something to do with the immature immune system, but what exactly it has to do with the immature immune system, we don't know. Again, Kalpana is working on that. She's gotten tonsils from a lot of patients who have um, FAPA uh, and then tonsils from kids that just have a tonsillectomy for some other reason as well. And she's found some differences in, you know, like the histology of the tonsils and so forth. And so at some point she may figure out, you know, what's, what is uh, so peculiar about uh, the, the um, immature immune system and why you would get these uh, episodes. But again, we don't have a, a good explanation. Great questions, lousy answers. At least know. right now. Gita, before your conclude, Gita, before your concluding remarks, Amita, madam wants yeah. to raise an issue. I just had uh, two more questions uh, done for you. One is that uh, you have tanker sore, PFAPA, and Bechet's as a spectrum. But in the first two, we have actually class two association, while in Bechet's we have a class one association. So why do we think that the HLA association is different if we think them as a spectrum? Is it the antigen which is linked with these diseases is different or is the environmental trigger is going to be different? Uh, 
and the canker sore and PFAP are very milder disease. And in patients, we have HLA class one association and we have something else which is interacting and causing the disease to be more severe. That's regarding the patients. And the second is regarding your excess in that, because I presented that general club today morning in our department from the nature NGM. So I was very perplexed that why do we have vacuolation? Uh -huh. I mean, what leads to the vacuolation? Okay, so the, your first question with regard to HLA and the Bechet spectrum disorders. Um, so that's an excellent question. And, you know, when Kalpana and I were talking about whether to propose this uh, idea of the Bechet spectrum disorders, it was with the idea that the spectrum was defined by the non HLA genes, you know, by things like IL-12 uh, and STAT-4, and that those are what define the spectrum, and then what determines where you are on the spectrum would be the HLA, you know, as to whether it's class one or class two. And you're right that the class one or class two probably does, to some extent, determine what antigens are, are uh, important in the pathogenesis of that. So, so I definitely uh, agree with that. And, and I think that the thing to keep in mind is that the spectrum um, is really defined by the non-HLA rather than the HLA. Now, with regard to the vexus question of what's, what are those vacuoles? Uh, what, what do they have in them? We don't know. I mean, that was one of the questions that we were interested in you know, from the very beginning. And David Beck actually has stained the cells from uh, patients with vexus with antibodies against various things, you know, and, and has used uh, immunohistochemical stains, you know, that will pick up this or that, uh, you know, chemical inside the cell. And so far, there's not anything that has come out as being the, you know, what it is. Um, it could be just that, you know, these cells are undergoing cell death and that it's a bunch of junk, you know, that's in there, uh, you know, that the cells are undergoing autophagy and that, that uh, it's not any one thing in particular. We don't know. It would be really interesting to find out, though. I can't hear you. You're muted. Is anybody asking a question? No, I'll just oh, thanks a lot, Dan, for a wonderful lecture and such a good explanation for all the questions. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. That's very kind. All right, other questions that people may have? Uh, Dr. Vinod has done uh, some work on familial Mediterranean fever. Uh, Dr. Vinod and Dr. Sandhya have published um, articles on familial Mediterranean fever from India. Do you have any questions, Dr. Vinod? No, I don't have any questions. Thank you, Dr. Kais, for the wonderful talk. Well, thank you for having me. I really have enjoyed this a lot. Shall we conclude if there are no more questions? Uh, yeah. Yeah, Dr. Ashraf? Please conclude. Okay, okay, conclude, conclude, please. So, uh, a respected guest of honor, uh, Professor Kastner, our respected teachers, colleagues, students, and friends, uh, on behalf of the organizing team that includes the Indian Academy of Pediatrics, Calicut, the Department of Pediatrics at Government Medical College, Kodikot, the CSIR Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology, Delhi, the Guardian Consortium, and the Foundation for Primary Immune Deficiency Diseases. I wish to express my deep sense of gratitude to Professor Kastner for accepting our invitation so graciously and enlightening us on a disease that is still an enigma to most clinicians in this part of the world. At Government Medical College, Koriko, we have been conducting a collaborative program along with the Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology Delhi over the last five years on primary immune deficiency disorders. This was supported by 
the Science and Engineering Research Board, Delhi, FPIR, and the CSIR. As a result, we now have a fairly large cohort of children with auto-inflammatory syndromes. And in fact, we also have the largest cohort of the hyper-IVD syndrome in the country. This has been possible through application of NGS technology, made available free of cost to our patients through the Guardian Consortium, which is a large research network of clinicians and scientists in the country. We feel that increasing awareness among clinicians, especially among pediatricians, is a critical cog in the wheel for the acquisition, for the recognition, sorry, and management of uh, these auto-inflammatory syndromes. This talk would definitely go a long way, I feel, towards uh, restoring the happy childhood to affected children, while at the same time, mitigating the financial and psychosocial burden and distress of affected families. Uh, today happens to be the International Child Rights Day. And I'm sure that um, our scientists, clinicians, and the pharmaceutical industry would come together and ensure that the availability of the much needed biologicals that we do not have now in the country and thus ensuring that our children will not be denied the benefits of precision medicine. We hope that your session will provide the much needed impetus for a rapid sea change in the situation. I would like to thank on behalf of the organizing team, each and every one of the delegates who have joined us from different parts of the world. We also would like to express our gratitude to Ms. Karen Tilgman for her uh, tireless work and her help over the last few weeks in arranging this talk. And uh, we also thank uh, Dr. Ranjit P., web editor of the Indian Academy of Pediatrics, who was our host this evening. We are really indebted to you, sir, and will always remember this talk that you gave tonight. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Gita. Thank you so much. Thank you all. I've really, you, really you, enjoyed thank it. You. This has been a wonderful thank honor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let us end the meeting. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.